colleagues, welcome. My name is Anthony McKay, and I have the good fortune to moderate this very important opening session. And I'm going to invite those who are participating in this opening session to join me as well. So, uh, Andreas, if you can uh, join me as well at this point. Wonderful. Minister Costa is with us as well. Thank you very much. Minister Callis is with us. Um, and obviously, uh, Matthias Corman is Secretary General of OECD. It's great to have you all here. And of course, we're being joined by many other colleagues uh, across multiple geographies. This is a very important moment because we are about to launch OECD's Digital Education Outlook for 2023 towards an effective digital education ecosystem. And can I just say that uh, there are many who have been looking forward to this moment. Uh, the document, the book has been released. Its companion, uh, the, the Country Digital Education Ecosystems and Governance volume has also been released. And we're looking forward to a number of very significant sessions over the coming hours. It's brilliant to have the Secretary General of OECD with us. Matthias Corman, thank you. Welcome. And I'm going to hand to you immediately to effectively launch the OEC Digital Education Outlook for 2023. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, dear Minister uh, Callas, Minister Costa, Deputy Chancellor McKay, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, all. A very warm welcome to this launch of the 2023 edition of the OECD's Digital Education Outlook. Uh, this second edition provides insights into how governments can set up efficient digital education ecosystems covering management, governance and instruction to, to improve learning outcomes, which is what this is, of course, all about. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, digital technologies, which up until that time had not been fully integrated into all classrooms, became the lifeline of education systems everywhere. In 2020, 1.5 billion students across 188 countries face school closures, ranging from a few days to several months, which, of course, compelled schools around the world to move online. As students and teachers adapted uh, to a digital learning environment, many countries very quickly set up online learning platforms. In fact, in 2022, 78% of the principals of schools participating in PISA uh, reported having an effective online learning support platform, which was a very significant 26% increase from 2018, just four years earlier. And while in 2018, 44% of teachers across eight countries reported using word processors or presentation software in most lessons. By 2022, students across OECD countries spend about two hours per day on digital devices for learning. Uh, since then, digital education technologies and their adoption continues to evolve, providing new opportunities to enhance students' learning experiences. Uh, for example, uh, intelligent tutoring systems which draw on artificial intelligence to tailor exercises and content to learners' needs can help identify students' difficulties and alert teachers about those difficulties and, and how to best address them. Uh, the overnight shift to remote and digital learning during the COVID pandemic did, of course, lead to a very significant drop in performance, though that wasn't the only reasons, but it highlights the need uh, to adopt a more strategic approach when it comes to the use of digital technologies in education, if, if that further highlight had indeed been necessary. Because the 2022 PISA results, which we launched, uh, launched last week, showed an unprecedented drop in performance since uh, the launch of the assessment back in 2000, right across uh, the OECD. Um, these results partially reflect the lack of preparation of students to switch to fully remote and autonomous learning during the pandemic and to self-regulate uh, the use of digital technologies. Importantly, though, they also show that incorporating digital technologies the right way uh, has positive impacts on performance. Uh, students who spend up to one hour per day learning on digital devices in school scored 14 points higher in maths than students who spent no time. However, if used mainly and excessively for leisure, digital technologies can become a distraction 
and drag down performance. And, and that is really what the data uh, in our most recent uh, PISA uh, results showed. Across the OECD and, and after adjusting for students and schools, the socioeconomic background, students who spend up to one hour a day on digital devices for leisure scored 49 points higher in maths than students who spend between five and seven hours per day on digital devices. Or to put it in a more relevant way, uh, the other way around, the students who spend between five and seven hours a day on digital devices scored 49 points lower in maths than those students who spend merely up to one hour a day on digital devices. This edition of the Digital Education Outlook provides recommendations on how education systems can optimize the benefits of the digital transformation for education, while also better managing some of the associated risks, challenges, and disruptions. First, uh, policymakers need to use digital technologies to support a broader shift towards more dynamic educational practices. Digital technologies can enable learning beyond the traditional classroom setting. I mean, that much is clear, allowing students to adapt the pace of learning to their individual circumstances and needs. However, for this to happen, teachers and schools require adequate training and digital infrastructure. And most importantly, it requires moving from replicating chalk and board teaching methods into digital formats to envision more dynamic forms of education, which encourage autonomous learning. Uh, for instance, Spain has set up a, pro a project, Classrooms of the Future, which transforms classrooms into dynamic active learning areas under the themes investigate, explore, interact, develop, create, and present. With each area, comprising different tasks, assisted by technologies such as virtual reality, which then promote the acquisition of skills and competencies, such as critical thinking, as they encourage learners to ponder diverse points of view to reach conclusions and make decisions. Second, uh, promoting interoperability, the capacity to combine and use data from disparate digital tools with ease and efficiency to enable better use of resources. There are many cases in which interoperability is beneficial for teachers and the school system as a whole. For instance, integrating data about students' trajectories and performance from different digital platforms can help in designing tailored learning programs. If built into broader e-government systems, interoperability can ease administrative burdens on students and teachers, for instance, by automatically populating university applications. The Digital Education Outlook found that in 16 out of 29 jurisdictions covered by this report, the learning management system is interoperable with either or both of system-wide student information systems and other institution-level systems, allowing for the efficient transfer of student data between systems. And Minister Costa will share how interoperability of information and data collected at various levels of government uh, supports decision-making in schools in Portugal, for example. And Minister Callas will present Estonia's unified digital ecosystem, which integrates school-level management tools with other e-governance tools. As in Portugal and Estonia, all good practices we identified across OECD countries have one thing in common. They required targeted policies and approaches to foster that interoperability. This can include developing common data standards for the whole education system and also providing incentives to providers of digital technologies to adopt these standards. For instance, calls for tender could require providers of digital technologies in education to use these common standards. Third, developing international standards and regulations to ensure the responsible use of artificial intelligence. This 2023 edition of the OECD Digital Education Outlook includes a standalone chapter on opportunities, guidelines, and guardrails for effective and equitable use of AI in education. The guidelines which we prepared in collaboration with Education International aim to support countries in harnessing the benefits of artificial intelligence technologies while addressing some of the potential risks. They focus on providing equality of opportunity uh, in terms of accessing digital ecosystems, empowering teachers with the appropriate competences and support, incentivizing the development of effective digital education technologies, and developing regulations that ensure the trustworthy and fair use 
of artificial intelligence. The guidelines build on the OECD's expertise and experience in providing guidance to governments on using AI in an innovative but also trustworthy way, including the 2019 OECD AI principles, uh, which we are currently in the process of updating uh, to account for developments in the field of artificial intelligence since their launch, including the proliferation, of course, of generative artificial intelligence tools available to the public at large, many of which have made their way into classrooms, such as Chat GPT. Which brings me to my last point. As digital technologies and their implications on the learning environment evolve, digital education policies will need to be adjusted to ensure their fitness for purpose. Digital technologies and their adoption in education settings will continue to advance faster than the policies and regulatory environment that govern them. This is why we must regularly, regularly monitor and evaluate the impact of our digital education policies and practices on learning outcomes, teacher performance, and student engagement, and evaluate whether they are addressing the risks associated with new technologies still in an appropriately effective way. For instance, currently few countries collect centralized data on physical digital infrastructure available in schools, nor on the use of digital technologies as management or teaching tools. This sort of data would be useful to more regularly assess the efficiency of spending against the use of technologies and against outcomes if data from national student assessments were incorporated uh, in monitoring systems. These assessments can be opportunities to update education policies by incorporating the evidence-based insights from digital education technology pilots in schools and from experiences in other jurisdictions, such as those presented in this outlook. So in closing, uh, digital education technologies have great potential to fundamentally and to positively transform the learning and the teaching experience. They can help teachers adapt the content and pace of learning for each student according to their specific needs. They can make learning more interactive, inspiring students' curiosity and fostering autonomous learning. And they can help students acquire the key skills that need to take advantage of the opportunities our societies and economies have to offer. Well-designed education policies can make this vision a reality and ensure every student benefits from the digital transformation of education to reach their maximum academic potential. But there are a whole range of issues that we need to uh, effectively address. And, and that is why uh, conversations like the one today and hopefully the discussions that will be generated by the release of this outlook uh, are so important. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Secretary General Matthias Coleman, thank you. Uh, at this moment, I think we can officially say the outlook has been launched. Uh, and I note that um, you have picked up on the separate chapter the OECD EI chapter that uh, looks at guidelines and guardrails for effective and equitable use of AI in education. And we'll make that a focus of uh, the session which follows this one. But I know we'll pick up on a number of those aspects in the conversation that flows from now. But thank you once again uh, for your opening statement. Uh, Andrea Schleicher, as OECD Director of education and skills. Can I pass to you for some opening comments before I come back to uh, both our ministers that Matthias has actually referred to, and we'll have a conversation about how particular countries are thinking about this work at the moment. But first to you, Andreas. Thanks so much, Tony. We're all obviously talking about something that is developing at a kind of breathtaking speed, you know. In 21, when we launched the last edition of this outlook, there were some who criticized us and said, well, what you're talking about is science fiction at the OECD. Well, now we are in 23 and everything that we presented as the frontier has become a reality. And actually, in some ways, artificial intelligence has bypassed the, our predictions from, from 21. So uh, watch that space. Now, 
what is the potential of this? Uh, clearly, you know, the biggest promise is to personalize learning. Now, while you study mathematics on a, on a device, the device can now understand how you learn, what makes you interested, what gets you bored, where you advance, where you get stuck, and then adapt learning environments in a much more personal way. Right? Learning uh, can become fun when you think about modern game-based learning environments. Now you can see virtual reality embedding learners in a three-dimensional world. You can actually do an experiment in a virtual laboratory rather than just having a teacher talking about this. Uh, augmented reality is super empowering the world in which students are. You can see amazing applications in the area of vocational education and training, uh, allowing students to learn while they actually do things. Uh, through augmented reality. You know? Some have found that you know sometimes when children explain things to a device, they learn faster than when someone talks to them and explains things to them. I mean, really amazing developments. Uh, then the biggest power of these tools is really the classroom analytics. Now, teachers can understand how different students learn differently and then engage with that diversity in much more kind of personalized and professional ways. You know? Uh, as a teacher, if you become a good data scientist, actually you can get so much more insights into uh, uh, different student learning needs and respond to them in, in real times. Now, as a teacher yourself, you can get personalized feedback. You can understand your interactions with people in the classrooms in ways that would not be possible. I mean, other than through, you know, traditional classroom observation. Now. Uh, one of the other promises is, is uh, to reintegrate learning and assessment. Now, some would say, you know, one of the biggest mistakes that we made in education was to divorce learning from assessment. Now, we ask students to pile up years and years and years and years of learning, and then we call them back in a very artificial setting under high pressure to do an exam. Well, that has actually, you know, had many negative implications on teaching and learning. And now suddenly, Technology allows us to reintegrate learning and assessment. And while you study, you get that personalized feedback. And then on the macro level, you have you know, micro credentials that can accumulate that kind of learning, building your learning trajectory, giving you so much more ownership over what you learn and how you learn and where you learn, and maybe also when in your life you learn. Now, but you know, we also have to be honest, the reality often still is very di di different. Uh, much of what we see in terms of technology is digitizing the analog, really. Now, I mean, we're basically using technology to do what we did traditionally in the classroom. That may have a few efficiency gains, but it's not transforming learning. You have something that you know we would call in this outlook digitalization, where actually technology is adapting learning environments, enhancing them, super empowering. But the digital transformation is still something else. This is about you know, reconfiguring the technology, the space, the people, the time, the relationships in the system in an entirely new way to raise productivity and personalization. And that's something that you know, is still the frontier. You see very few examples, even though one of the you know, goals of this outlook is actually to present those frontiers and to talk about what would it take to actually enhance the digital transformation. And uh, we have data from 80, uh, 28 countries, uh, 29 education systems uh, that responded to a questionnaire that gave us a good sense of where systems are and where they are going. Let me show a few results. Now, first, you see that most countries have some form of a, you know, student information system. That's not uh, very, 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 that, that, that's quite frequent now. But Actually, when you think about who is producing learning analytics, you know, in form of a dashboard, and this is where AI and tools like this come up, this is actually still the minority of countries. Now. So yes, we collect a lot of data, but when it comes to you know bringing that data back to have students learn better, teachers teach better, schools to operate more effectively, that's still a lot more limited. Now. Uh, and you can see that here, for example, the first thing that you need if you want to build a longitudinal kind of data systems that track student performance is a unique ID of people. Now, and even that is not yet commonly established. Real-time information, less frequently. Standardized test results, now, tracking performance. Only 13 out of 29 jurisdictions provide those kinds of tools. So here you can see that actually implementation is still quite patchy. There's some education systems well advanced, well on their way, but others who are still much more in the in the process of you know digitizing the analog than enabling the digital transformation. But there are some good exceptions. You know, actually, uh, in the in the outlook, one of the most interesting 
you know, uh, parts is really this this annex that provides all, or this the second volume that provides all of the the systems. Uh, and uh, documents all of the system. And here you can see from the Colorado statewide long regional system, uh, where you can actually look at this through the perspective of a school, an educator, an administrator, parent, a student, and you get actually a good sense of where the education system stands in ways that are relevant for you. Now, we see that many, uh, many digital tools are now quite well established in schools, but when it comes to the use of AI, that is also still more the exception than the rule. Yeah. Study and career guidance for students, that's basically very common administrative you know, tools. That's also, I think, an important you know, uh, point of those kinds of systems. If you think about it, uh, administrative work is what teachers hate to do most, what is least effective for them, uh, what makes them most kind of <clears throat> uh, put them under stress and you can actually digitize a lot of those processes and that is happening. Learning management systems also quite well as well. Student admission, now, that's also how you can actually, you know, track student admission and so on. Uh, uh, quite a number of management tools now uh, available. But again, you know, much of that is still quite traditional technology. Very little is empowered by artificial intelligence. So what would it take to do the digital transformation? As Secretary General Corman has explained, interoperability is absolutely central. Now, putting all of the pieces together so that you can harness the power of data, share it, and use it to actually improve systems. Now, and you can see that's only happening currently in 13 out of 29 jurisdictions. Now. And then you know interoperability with system level administrative systems even less frequently. So, so that is a really, really important policy objective so that we get away from the patchwork where sometimes also teachers have to use you know, different applications that are not compatible, that cannot share their data to work towards more integrated systems. And that involves standards, uh, very technical standards that the software, the applications are compatible, uh, consistency of definitions, coding rules, the data models, so that we can actually share you know, data across applications, across goods, throughout the system. And then there are framework conditions that are really central. Now, the business processes, the institutional agreements, then the legal aspects, you know, how do we reconcile free data flows with privacy and data security, and so on. Ownership of data, very critical issues. So those, those two aspects, uh, a really central to uh, enhance interoperability. And then the second aspect is competencies. How do you actually enable support teachers to understand those tools, use them wisely, understand the limitations? And in many countries, we have seen a devolution of responsibility. So schools suddenly got in charge of this, but that doesn't mean that they often have the the abilities and tools to do that wisely. Now, so some, as you can see, have, have standards for pre-service uh, training. So basically having certain requirements of what teachers need to uh, be able to do in terms of digital competencies. Uh, but as you can see, that is still uh, only 15 out of 29 systems. And uh, for in-service training is only three out of 29, now, basically requiring teachers to upgrade their skills on a regular basis. Now, so this is an area that also warrants a lot more attention to make this work. One example that is very positive is Austria's Digicomp model uh, that provides a framework for how you enter the profession, how you discover digital resources, how you employ them, but also how you as a teacher contribute to the design and development of digital tools. And I do think that's also really, really important where we do not engage the teaching profession in the design of those tools, can't expect them to become really, really good at implementation. So uh, if we want to seize the opportunities, you know, it's about personalizing learning, it's about fostering inclusion and equity, it's about enhancing uh, teaching quality, it's about, you know, improving efficiency and effectiveness of process, and also, you know, learning something about the system, innovating the system, and making education more relevant. Now, those are clearly the big promises that such an integrated strategy uh, has for us, and we need to mitigate some of the risks. No, this is about digital divides. Uh, yeah, there is clearly a risk that those technologies will enhance, super empower those who are already highly skilled, who have access to the right tools, and leave others further behind. No? 
the performance of digital school tools. We must acknowledge that, you know, some of those tools are not as great as they look. You know, some of the predictions that AI based tools are making and that teachers rely on are accurate in many cases, but not in some and the cost of those mistakes can actually be very high. So performance needs to be looked at. Then, then you know, uh, to some extent, you know, technology can accelerate, amplify biases uh, and uh, in the system. Now, there are inefficiencies in the digital ecosystem and there is this issue of privacy and data protection and the ethics of artificial intelligence. But, you know, uh, the digital outlook provides lots of really good examples for, for how those risks can be successfully addressed so that we can mitigate uh, uh, and mitigate it so that we can harness the opportunities. Thank you, Tony. Andreas, thank you. Uh, superb. Uh, and a, a, an opportunity, I think, for us to appreciate um, what in the opening of the outlook is referred to as uh, three key areas, one around the digitization of our education systems, the second around digitization in our classrooms, and the third, as you commented, around the importance of human-centered approaches and how we handle all of those dimensions uh, is the challenge before us. Well, I'm delighted that um, not only can I ask those who have joined us online to contribute via the chat, but to have uh, Minister Callis, who is Minister of Education Research in Estonia, and Minister Costa, Minister of Education in Portugal, and already the Secretary General has mentioned both of you <laughs> and the approaches that you are taking in Estonia and Portugal. So perhaps before we get into uh, some questions that might help people to appreciate uh, the opportunities, uh, as well as the challenges. You might just say something about the state of play in your respective jurisdictions. So perhaps, um, Minister Callis, can I come to you first and perhaps a, uh, an opportunity for us to appreciate how uh, you are seeing uh, this outlook uh, in relation to Estonia, uh, the vision you have, the reality that's emerging, um, the state of play. Uh, could you capture that for us in a few minutes? Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you for listening and giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, Estonia. Well, um, Estonian journey of digitalization of systems um, has been by now 23 years long. So uh, for us, uh, digitalizing systems in, in terms of how the government operates is something that has been going on for very many, many, many years, two decades, more than two decades now. So we have our education systems are also digitalized. So what um, Andrea showed us how the uh, data um, for policy purposes is digitally managed about education, about the schools. Um, this is something that we have had for a very long time. I always bring this example of my own children because my uh, my children, my young, my oldest child started school in 2015, and I bought him a diary. You know, this paper diary that that I used to have in school. That you have to write in your notes regarding what homework you have to do, what grades you have. The teacher uses this diary to communicate with the parents. So basically, a lot of data is saved in this uh, diaries, school diaries, and personal diaries. And then after half a year he digged it out from his school bag and asked me, mom, why did you buy me this? What am I supposed to do with it? And it turns out that it was never used in school. Uh, so everything is digital. All the data is inserted digitally. All information is run in a platform that is connected between parent, student, and a teacher. They all connected in the platform system. And the data is there. So we, we had to get rid of this paper diary because he was just carrying with it for six months, not understanding why the mother packed it with him to the to the school. So this uh, digital education systems we have and we are we are in the in the ambitious process of uh, updating it so that we can have even more accurate data regarding um, a learning process. Uh, what Andrea Schleicher mentioned, um, uh, you know, the classroom analytics uh, also for the, for, the, for the teachers and the classroom analytics also for the educa education politicians or pol policy makers. I think this is, this is a process where we go when we talk about digitalizing systems themselves. 
Now, digitalizing classrooms um, uh, regarding the learning process itself, what is taking place in the classroom, uh, there I would rather say that Estonia has been um, more cautious uh, regarding gadgets and more focused in competences, in, in digital competences. Uh, since 2011, we, we have included uh, digital competences as part of curricula for different uh, age groups of the students. What kind of digital competences our students need to have? They have been designed in a curricula since 2011. And uh, for, for last five years, we have been also training pre-service, but also in-service, a lot of in-service teachers in digital competences. So we have been focusing rather on developing apps or tools. We have been focusing on designing teachers' digital competences and training them. And it proved for us to be a right uh, road to go because when the pandemic happened, uh, the question was not whether the teachers were skilled enough to find which uh, app to use or which program to use. The key actually was uh, whether the teachers had competences to know how the learning process through the digital means actually could possibly take place and how the learning process should be designed through digital tools if it's not happening in the classroom. So we are in the new era of developing digitalization of a classroom right now when we need to bring um, AI into the classroom, into the learning processes of the classroom. Uh, we are not there yet. It's not integrated into our learning processes. But since we are keeping very open mind regarding AI as a part of the learning process, so it, Estonia is in a process of uh, redesigning um, curricula, national curricula, by designing more um, personalized learning processes, as what Andrea Schlechter also mentioned, like more possibility of using AI to design more personalized learning routes, uh, paths to, to students, and to integrate AI mostly into feedback to performance. I think in, in, in education, in learning, the most crucial uh, part is getting feedback to how are you doing, how are you actually learning, because that's essential part of the learning. I very much agree with the fact that if you don't get the feedback and you only get it after nine years of school, realizing that your math levels are not where they are supposed to be, then that's something that has been uh, a mistake in education and has been an instant feedback regarding how you are progressing in, in, in your learning pass. And that's what AI is capable of doing. And I always also bring in this example of my daughter uh, who has struggling, like I think most of her generation has been struggling with a capital letter. You know, the messaging uh, generation does not know that the sentence starts with a capital letter or that there is a, a dot at the end of the sentence and then there is a capital letter again. So uh, in, in old times, the teacher had to be constantly giving feedback that your capital letter is wrong, you don't use it correctly. Currently, I think AI is is very helpful uh, you know, uh, teacher here by, by constantly working with my daughter and reminding her and, and she through repetition learns that the capital letter has to be at the beginning of the sentence. Things like that, which we are looking now, how, to, how do we bring an AI as an assistant to the teacher to more personalize the learning path because not everybody in the class needs to learn capital letter, but some students need to learn it longer than the others. And, and then uh, that's how the AI needs to be uh, there in the classroom. So this is where we are focusing our attention right now, uh, focusing on the classroom learning and how digital uh, technology and especially AI will assist teachers in doing more personalized uh, learning for each student separately. Tony, you're on mute. I was so keen to make sure that uh, there was no background noise. That, um, I wasn't unmuted. I, I was just saying, uh, Christina, I'll come back to you and I'd love you to make a bit more of a comment. There are a few chat contributions here about the role of the system in supporting the profession uh, in precisely the ways that you are talking about and also uh, the profession itself and its own leadership. Uh, Interesting couple of questions that are coming through, but I'll come back to you. Um, Minister Costa, what about the, uh, the the kind of state of play in Portugal? Can you give us some headlines in the same way that Christina did? Sure. Thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you to 
uh, Andreas and the, and the Secretary General for the invitation to participate in this in this uh, webinar and this launch. Um, and um, it's a very great pleasure to share this panel with uh, with Minister Christina. Uh, also, because we many times we've looked into Estonia as an example of uh, an advanced country in terms of digitalization in education. So we always can learn from each other when we have these uh, these shared experiences. Well, um, I'd, uh, first, I'd like to, to give a bit of praise for, for the way uh, OECD organizes this outlook, because we're really going into the, the two directions that we need to take into account, uh, the administration side and the educational side. And these appear to be independent, but they are uh, uh, very much uh, interconnected. Uh, in Portugal, like in Estonia, we have most of the, of the information is digitalized. Most schools communicate with parents through, through digital platforms. What we are doing now, uh, and thanks also to our uh, recovery and resilience uh, plans uh, uh, and the funds for this, is to integrate this platform. So we created uh, lots of individual platforms. This uh, creates problems for our information system because depending on the platform you consult, you may get different information. And also for the school principals, this is a nightmare. Uh, of filling out, uh, filling in information in different in different resources. So this is a step we're taking uh, to make these uh, these uh, platforms more unified. To have a student uh, unique student ID uh, that is uh, prompts the access for all the information, and that it can evolve into having a more direct relationship also with the teachers, with the student follow up, and uh, and with the parents. Now. I'd like to focus more on on the other side of the of the outlook. So what uh, what this uh, we call it transformation uh, uh, in education that digitalization can bring. And uh, I always like to 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 frame things in education in terms of uh, intentionality and uh, and balance. And uh, uh, always the, the first question is uh, why are we are doing this and. Uh, uh, in many countries and in Portugal too, uh, the ongoing debate is sometimes very sterile. It's uh, those who deify technology and uh, think that technology is uh, is the alpha and the omega of education, and those that diabolize uh, uh, technology as if we lived uh, in a world uh, in which technology is not part of our of our daily life. And I think that the the the, the answer lies somewhere in between. Uh, that is to say. Uh, we need to develop digital competencies for all the reasons that Christina mentioned. Uh, uh, it's also a matter of equity and inclusion. We know that there is a social divide uh, in the access and in the capacity to, 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 to deal with technology, uh, especially to deal with the, the avalanche of information that we get through technology. Uh, we saw, I think that's one of the most important pieces that sometimes is not regarded as so important in the last education at a glance is the, the, the correlation between qualification and qualification with these capacities and social participation, the belief in conspiracy theories. And we know the less we can manage to navigate through this world of information that gets to us through technology, the more vulnerable we are uh, to manipulation the more vulnerable our democracies are, uh, because we know that the bad usage of technology uh, is affecting the quality uh, of democracies with the, the promotion of radicalism, hate speech, and, uh, and all of that. And so uh, this is uh, rather than playing with the machines, so to speak, uh, what we really need to do, and this is the focus of Portugal, is to have an integrated approach uh, to, 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 to the digital competencies that we want to promote in the students, uh, to help them to develop information literacy, uh, to help them to, to see technology as a tool and not as an end by itself. And that's why in the capacity building programs that we are doing in professional development with the teachers, we are focusing more on the highest level, which is how to plan a classroom uh, with the benefit of technology, uh, so that we can take advantage of this. Uh, if a student today, uh, a Portuguese student wants to know to visit some part of Estonia, they can uh, uh, go on the internet and visit a museum in Estonia, and the Estonian students can visit a museum 
uh, in Portugal. And this is very good. So this is very good that we have more information that is available that is not restricted to the privileged ones. Uh, but uh, this only works if we use it for uh, for this purpose. And then uh, uh, the other thing is about uh, is about uh, 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 as I mentioned uh, citizenship and what we want to do th with this. And we know that uh, we are here discussing uh, digitalization and technology and AI, uh, but we know that there are other major questions for our uh, for our species, so to speak. Uh, for instance, climate change, uh, the role of multiculturalism, and these are no longer topics that we can ascribe to one subject. What is the subject of climate change? So we need to integrate knowledge. We need interdisciplinarity in order to address these uh, these topics. And this is something that the technology can help us do. I, I visited a school uh, last week in Portugal. Uh, we are installing digital labs uh, in, uh, in all the schools. And they were using this lab that we installed in the school to work on pollution and sustainability, bringing together the teacher of science, the teacher of ICT, the teacher of Portuguese, uh, the, the teacher of arts to create a, a systemic approach to the teaching of climate change. And this is where the technology is a tool because it, it helps us relate, help us connect uh, the dots in this knowledge that is uh, distributed uh, with the within all this. Then when I talk about balance, so it is about this right uh, split between what is the intention, what is the means, what is the goal, uh, but also a balance uh, that we need because school is about human development. The pandemic showed us that there is no machine replacing the human act of teaching, uh, the eye in the eye, uh, the, the proximity. Uh, and so uh, schools develop persons and persons also need to play outside to talk uh, to read books in paper because the concentration is different uh, we need the arts we need to go to the theater and we need to know also and now just with a final word on artificial intelligence artificial intelligence will be very good at giving us questions and so this means that uh, knowing how to ask uh, how to ask them is becoming more and more important than knowing, than knowing the solution. And this is very, very challenging because we spend, we adults, grown-ups, spend all of our time uh, in a school that wants us to give the right answer even when we don't understand the question. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is turning things upside down and it's very, very challenging. That is uh, the scope. The scope of those comments, uh, Christina, yourself, uh, Anjo, make us, I think, aware of the fact that we are looking at an environment that reminds us that the purpose of learning, <laughs> the purpose of our education systems, uh, spans looking after self, others, and the planet, and therefore, uh, this digital education outlook serves that multiple level right, of how we are thinking about this work. Christina, just say a word extra about uh, on the personalization side, um, where I think you were helping us to appreciate that some people are saying it's a, it's a shift from a, a performance culture to a progress culture, where we will have real-time data, as you said, feedback, right, that supports young people in their learning, in the progress that they're making, in ways that we have not been able to support young people adequately. And when Andrea shows a slide that says, and this can be done with fun <laughs> and levels of engagement, uh, then you get a sense at the personalization level of just what the promise is. D do you feel that this is really starting to become uh, more deeply understood amongst the profession and the system is actually supporting this? Uh, I think it's a very, very good question because uh, I, I'm not sure yet that we very deeply understand how this personalized learning process itself will take place. Uh, we do understand what opportunities it provides us, but uh, we don't really know what, what are the challenges in, in, the, in the process itself. What we do now in Estonia, we're in a process where we are, we work with... Um, 
conceptual level of this personalized learning, not about integrating it into school, but conceptually trying to understand uh, what kind of learning uh, can be personalized and, and how it can be personalized, because we can't do it by experimenting way, because the risks that we are very clearly understanding in personalized learning is that personalized learning can very quickly uh, turn into machine-led learning. So, you know, the machine is feeding you constantly feedback in your nearest comfort zone. It's, it's not really challenging you uh, regarding your uh, competences in many other aspects that you need to be challenged. I mean, you, the, the machine is challenging you in a very limited and it has a bias. It's, it's, it, machines are biased. So in this sense, there is a risk that we need to be aware. What we are, the way we are conceptualizing it right now is actually that the personalized learning uh, processes of students need to be connected to the classroom analytics for the teacher. So basically the person who still uh, designs the learning process for the students is a teacher. It's not the machine because if the machine starts designing learning process for the students, uh, we are a little bit in trouble <laughs> because that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. the, that's the, you know, the, the science fiction movie where the machines take over the consciousness of humans and, and, and they will start leading us and we will become more and more like machines themselves because the machines are the ones teaching us. What, what we need is, as what Andrea Schleicher also showed, you, you, you are capable of assisting and giving immediate feedback and assessment to the students with the machine. But this needs to be connected to the classroom analytics so the teacher can see what kind of learning process is taking place with each, with, with each of the students in the classroom, where yep. the students are with their learnings, and then use this professional skills there as a teacher to design the learning process for those kids. So that's, that's where we are right now, but I'm not even claiming that Estonia is there to, to implement it. We are in the process of uh, conceptualizing how this will possibly could be taking place uh, and what do we need to do in our curricula uh, to allow uh, this, these processes to happen in school. Got it. So uh, let me just ask you and Andreas uh, a question that's emerging. Um, the subtitle of this uh, report is Towards an Effective Digital Education Ecosystem. So, um, Minister Costa, what are you? It, it struck me that you were reaching into that space uh, in your opening comments, and the companion volume suggests that ecosystemic work will require different forms of governance. So I wonder whether you might say a word about this, and then Andreas might as well. Yeah. So, um, in a way, it's what I was saying in the first intervention that we need to look at this uh, in a systemic way. Uh, with care, uh, I, I would say, uh, this te technology is advancing way faster than uh, is the regular pace of education systems. Uh, for good and for bad, uh, we are uh, conservative and slow for good and for bad. And um, it's very, it's very easy to get uh, to get a bit lost in uh, in all of this and uh, throw throw away important things. Uh, that we know how to do because we are we are uh, we find that uh, the technological world is uh, is uh, is uh, fantastic. Uh, so I think we need to focus on what can be in this ecosystemic approach, as you were saying, uh, the benefits of uh, where we are stepping into. For instance, uh, like uh, like Christine was saying, uh, we don't know yet much about the the, the potential for personalized learning, uh, but we know that we can, as governments, as international organizations, to set an agenda for what can be more beneficial for the education systems. And we see that this can be a path uh, uh, to know how technology, how artificial intelligence will help us do what is most challenging these days, which is to individualize and to take care of diversity inside the classroom. Students are all different. Students have different paces of learning. Students have different interests. And if school plays a role in massification of knowledge, and that is a good one, we know that in order to reach this massification, 
we take different paths. So that's something that we can learn about. And then AI is about uh, huge collections of data and uh, 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 an enormous capacity of dealing with this data and, uh, and, uh, and making calculations. And we know that uh, we are at a moment, which is very interesting when we talk about international cooperation, because uh, most education policies, even in the European Union, are very domestic. But when we meet, we are discussing the same thing. Uh, we are discussing equity. We are discussing digital transition. We are discussing uh, 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 teacher shortage. We are discussing exactly the same topics. And uh, this crossing of information and this gathering of information can help us uh, have stronger databases that trace profiles. For instance, who are the children that are at risk of being uh, early school leavers? Uh, who are the children that are at risk of uh, failing? Who are the children that uh, uh, have a profile uh, that uh, uh, requires for some more practical approaches to teaching or more theoretical approaches to teaching? These, these are beneficial tools because we can find patterns, we can learn from each other, we can know about efficacy of strategies. Yeah. So this is where we can get data uh, that we are able to share and getting the most benefit from these tools. Thank you. But this is, but Andres, this is all speculation. <laughs> uh, Andres, just say a word about the, the the ecosystemic nature of this work that this 23 outlook identifies. Yeah, you can look at this through several lenses. You know, there is uh, technology, devices, there is data, there are people and their competencies and there are systems and governance and we, these need to really play together. You know, devices will only help us if they're interoperable. Data can only yeah. help us if they are in, uh, free flowing and, you know, connect individuals over time, over space. And uh, and uh, the, you, you need to have a governance and regulatory environment in place that enables those that, that consistency and coherence. Otherwise, you know, technology can lead to more issues and, and, and challenges for teachers and actually to help them. And that's what the fragmentation that we currently see is all about. I just want to sort of add, you know, uh, I'm not sure I agree that, you know, uh, technology is biased, you know. Actually, I would say, you know, uh, technology can accelerate and uh, amplify human biases. No? I mean, a uh, AI is also, you know, AI is ethically neutral, but it's always in the hands of people who are not neutral. And that's really what we have to get our hands on. You know, the kind of training data that are being used, to what extent, you know, uh, <clears throat> do we ensure that we, uh, that A, you know, the training data is well understood by the educators and uh, the reliability of the outcomes are understood. The, the digital outlook devotes a lot of attention to this. You know, do educators understand uh, the merits and the limits of, of, of the algorithms and the data that are being uh, deployed here? And I think in that, uh, that is really critical here. It's not the the, the, the biases come from us humans, you know, the training data come from us humans and what technology does it, it just uses them and extrapolates from them and just put it up to a massive scale. We've got just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to have to ask each of you just to make a final comment um, of, of no more than uh, 60 seconds, <laughs> just to be explicit. But can I just say there's a range of contributions that have come through the chat. Can I just say to those who are asking questions about uh, under-resourced regions uh, and how we're going to support work uh, globally, that that will be the focus of a subsequent session. By the way, Andreas, it's interesting that each of you have picked up on the interoperability, the integration, that's come through the questions in quite a significant way. And I think the other point is that people are seeing the prospects, again, as each of you have indicated, of a very different use of time, space and people that uh, the way in which we think about our learning environments uh, is going to uh, be evolving. But let me ask you to make a final comment. It's probably a little bit in the spirit, Andreas, of your final slide around risk mitigation. There's a few people who are saying, listen, um, could we cooperate, please, internationally around this agenda? Well, OECD obviously uh, has that absolutely at its uh, heart. But I think, Minister Costa, you said, hey, listen, we learn from each other here. 
So just a final comment on how you feel that we can take this agenda forward, this outlook forward over the next uh, couple of years and really support each other. So, Minister Callis, let me ask you to make a final comment. I suppose I'm trying to be as optimistic about this as possible without obviously denying that there are real challenges. Uh, yes, I will be very quick. Um, well, education systems are still, in, in that sense, um, uh, national, but they are not international, right? Very national, and, and, and countries are very much keen to keep the keep it that way, and, and, and there are reasons for that. So education systems operate nationally, but the technology that they use, uh, the AI that they use, is international. Yeah. We share it all the same. It's it's all the same globally, which means that we don't have a, a choice. <laughs> we we do have to cooperate when it comes to technology uh, and uh, and what, what what kind of technology there is. How do we use it, and how do we uh, even regulate that use? This is something that we have to do uh, commonly. So I predict that our education systems will be uh, moving towards more common space because the technology they sh we share is the same. So thank you. Brilliant. Come in. Minister Costa, give us your final comment. Yeah, so my 60 seconds, I think we, we really need, as I said before, to learn from each other, to gather evidence, and we need to cooperate because uh, this is too difficult an issue. We need for edu the educational space, we need research from the neurosciences so that we know what are what is the cognitive impact of uh, some of these technologies. We need to learn about uh, pedagogic strategies. Uh, we need to we need to discuss, like uh, like Christina was saying, regulation. I, I really think that AI needs regulation. I'm glad that the European Union are taking these taking steps uh, on this. And uh, and we need uh, to listen to everyone. This cannot be something that in which we leave teachers and students aside. Uh, uh, this has to be a community project. And uh, and for this, we need we really need international cooperation. Thank you. Andres, a final word. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, Minister Callas has already ex expressed, you know, the technology is international, the algorithms are international. We need sort of a, a, a global ecosystem for this also when it comes to regulation. But I'd like to get uh, one step further. I do think there's huge scope for the world to more proactively share, you know, educational resources and, and, and content globally. You know, I mean, when I, I saw the question about, you know, how can we support, you know, less developed regions? Yeah, technology is one bottleneck, but the big bottleneck really is about content and, and resources. And I think if we were doing a better job to mutualize open educational resources, you know, in the past, you know, we had to pay high tuition to get to a university because there are very few teachers and very, very little content and very many people wanted to access this. Today, we have for the first time that possibility to make the best learning resources available to everyone with, who has the prerequisites. And we're not doing that. We have actually seen very little progress. There are organizations, you know, like Khan Academy that have outpaced any intergovernmental collaboration when it comes to mutualizing education resources. And I think as governments, there's a lot that uh, can be done to actually create a more shared space where actually the world can benefit from what has been done in, in education resources. Well, look, thank you. Uh, that is a fantastic conversation. It feels uh, far too limited amount of time to explore. But of course, there are subsequent sessions that will be tackling a whole variety of the issues that you've raised. In fact, one that's just emerged uh, will be at the heart of the next session. Uh, uh, that uh, will give us the opportunity to look at the the joint uh, standalone paper in Chapter 16 of this report uh, from OECD and EI, because people are saying this must involve the teaching profession, as each of you have said, in a very significant way, um, leading in ecosystems and the relationship between government and the profession and new forms of governance that you've all raised. So. Fantastic session. Thank you each uh, for the contribution. And uh, I know that others who have been participating in this session have found it highly valuable. So thank you. And colleagues, uh, we have got about a two minute break between this session and the next. So we'll see a number of you in just a couple of minutes. Thanks again.
Hello, Anthony. Um, are you expecting me in this panel? Just thought I'd ask. Hi, Alison. Yeah, please do join us. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I was um, asked at the last moment and then asked to join another panel. Uh, so I'm just checking that you're expecting me to be here. Well, um, put it this way. Um, uh, we're, I'm very happy that you do join us for this panel. Let me ask Stefan whether he was wanting to hold you for another and whether he's happy that no, no, you are no. participating in this one. You're invited to both, uh, Alison. I was just saying that this one, right. one of us will have to speak for a very short period of time. So that's why you're also in the other one. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's great. great, Alison. Thank you. Being, being invited to two parties is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Anthony, um, Tony, we... you can begin now. If uh, if you're ready to begin, I think everybody's ready and the people have joined, new people have joined as well. Can I just double check whether Randy is with us? Randy is with us. Oh, great. Oh, hi, Randy. Great. Hi, sorry, Tony. Oh, Wonderful. Randy. Good to see you. That's you lovely. Too. Do you want to do a count? Do you want to do a count in or are you happy for me to start immediately? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Colleagues, welcome to a very significant session uh, in a very important day of launching the OECD Digital Education Outlook 2023, and in particular, an opportunity to look at both uh, Chapter 16 of that report and a standalone paper in its own right that identifies opportunities and guidelines and guardrails for effective and equitable use of AI in education. Uh, this was a joint exercise between OECD and Education International. And we have the opportunity in this hour to focus upon what that paper is arguing for, particularly in terms, I think, of guidelines. Now we're joined by a remarkable group of people, but I'm not going to introduce everybody at the one time. <laughs> Andre Schleicher, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, as uh, OECD Director of Education and Skills. Randy Weingarten um, is known to all of you as uh, not only President uh, of AFT in the US, but Randy, I think you have chaired uh, the work uh, between OECD and EI uh, that has been so important uh, for this conversation. Um, and Donnie, I'm going to come to you a little uh, in a few moments and get you to introduce yourself in an appropriate way. But <laughs> what we might do just to begin is to ask, as it were, both OECD and EI uh, through Andreas and through Randy to say a little about this uh, separate report, but also a major chapter uh, in the outlook. So, uh, Andreas, are you happy to take the lead and then uh, I'll come to Randy? Yes, absolutely. And uh, just a word, you know, when we invented cars, uh, soon after we invented seatbelts and road signs to make sure that cars work for us and not against us. And that's really what we're talking about here to, you know, be clearer about the opportunities the, uh, the and, and also establish meaningful guidelines and guardrails uh, for the use of uh, uh, AI in education. And uh, why did we do that with Education International? Well, the answer is clear. You know, those guidelines are only as val valuable as uh, what is put in practice. And the people who are who are using them and who are who putting this in practice are the educators in the classroom. So it is vitally important that they are, you know, part of this process. And in fact, you know, part of the design of this process. That's why we work together with Education International, the union of the unions to, to uh, build uh, this framework. Let me just talk you through that briefly. Uh, basically, uh, there are nine kind of principles that we have established. Some deal simply with providing, you know, equitable access uh, to the digital ecosystem. That's of course the first conditions now to, uh, to learners, to educators have access uh, to technology and also <clears throat> Uh, the learning resources. Now, without that, and, and nothing else will work. But that's not not enough. It is equally important that teachers uh, are well supported, have the, the knowledge, the skills, uh, the right attitudes, actually uh, to work uh, with those kinds of tools and technologies, understand their merits, understand their limitations. Now, if you do not understand an algorithm, 
you're going to be soon the slave of that algorithm. And, you know, once again, AI is not a magic power. It's just an amazing amplifier and accelerator. It's going to amplify good ideas and good educational practice in the same way it amplifies poor ideas and poor educational practice. Now, AI can super empower teachers to understand how different students learn differently, or it can disempower them, you know, through scripted lesson plans, which they follow without necessarily a deep understanding on them. So that's why this is also really important. Uh, but even that is not enough. Uh, we are seeing a lot of technological possibilities and still, you know, currently much of the reality is digitizing the analog is not digital transformation. So how can we incentivize the development of digital resources? Uh, and this is about, you know, uh, creating environments where educators, researchers, technology experts co-create uh, digital learning tools and also advance the research and the design. You want to get teachers in that space of becoming creative designers of innovative learning environments that are technology enabled because they are the experts on learning and uh, have to do that. And then last but not least, the, the, the hard nuts to crack. We talked about them already a little bit in the beginning sessions. It's really about, you know, ethics, safety, data protection. Uh, we need free data flows to use the data. At the same time, we want to ensure privacy and and, and, and those things are sometimes not straightforward to, to reconcile. They're trade-offs that we are making. We make them in our private lives, often very generously. In schools, we're often very restrictive. And it's really a question of balance. There's also, I think, an important dimension of transparency, explainability of algorithms. Uh, do I understand the algorithm, how they are negotiated, and superhuman support? and uh, human alternatives, now, understanding the risks. Now, let me just you know, share a few examples now, on the guideline on equitable access to and use of digital resources. This is really about providing quality digital learning resources to teachers and, and, and students. And what I want to emphasize here, quality digital resources, now, resources that make sense and that actually are proven to be effective. Now. Uh, making sure that teachers have discretion over their application, uh, that they need, they need to fit their kind of instructional environment, the context of the school, the context of their students. So again, this is a kind of negotiation process. And then provide guidance on uh, so that teachers and learners can, you know, have the best opportunities to develop their, their skills. Uh, uh, that's really sort of an example of how the guideline on, on equitable access really works to ensure that those resources are available. Similarly, you can look at the guidelines on teacher agency and professional learning. Now, how can we integrate effective users of digital learning resources into every educator's professional competencies? And you can see here, um, this is currently very limited. Uh, there's less than uh, well, just about half of the countries that have currently regulations on teacher competences before the end of the profession and only three out of 29 who actually, you know, require certain standards uh, for teachers to advance in their career. So there's certainly lots more that we can do. And then also, uh, it's important to actually get teachers in the center of that, their agency, their capacity to their leadership to make, you know, you good use, critical use of those kinds of learning uh, resources. No. And um, maybe I, I just stop here and um, let Randy talk about the guidelines as well. So thank you, Andreas. And as always, it's always great, Tony, to go after Andreas because then I don't have to prepare anywhere as much as I would have to prepare normally <laughs> because he goes through the landscape he has an amazing PowerPoint. It's explainable and understandable. And if only other supervisors, administrators, and leaders could actually act that way, teachers would have the discretion that they really need in schools because I think Andreas actually really painted the picture of the guard of, of, of these joint principles. So I just wanna say a couple of things. So number one, just like Previously, when we did joint principles on well being, on um, helping the whole child, on COVID principles, by having the OECD nations and the organization that leads the teachers who teach in these OECD nations come together on sets of principles, it sends a message about a direction. 
and about yep. what we should be doing. And that's why I think it's important that we do this together. And so I'm very grateful, as is all of EI, that we are doing this, the, that we did these principles together. Second, just like almost anything in artificial intelligence, frankly, I would say anything in humanity right now, these are a continuum. A continuum. They are not static. Um, and AI is not static. And in fact, you know, generative AI is both very, has tremendous promise and tremendous peril because it is the first time, and, and, and Andreas talked about it in terms of the algorithm, but it's also the first time that a machine can actually generate knowledge in a very different way and in a faster way and a different way than human beings. So it's part of the reason why many of the makers of AI immediately came out and said, we have to really realize the risks else this can kill society. Or they didn't use those words, but they use words to that effect. So the issues around ethics and standards and guardrails and responsibilities are things that the whole of society must work on, particularly governments and the tech companies. Um, and I really applaud the EU for doing the work and doing it in a in a as fast and an effective way because they're leading the world in terms of being able, as 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 Andrea said, you know, we have the automobile, but we then had seat belts and we then had traffic lights. Because to harness the potential writ large as a universe, as a world, we need to be able to also have those guardrails and that safety. And I think that's very that's really, really important. And so on a, that, that's on a macro level. At a micro level, as much as I think education is macro and is you know, the most important thing we can do in the world, other than probably peace and security, um, we also need to have those guardrails for safety, for privacy, for things, um, for, uh, uh, for ways to attack disinformation and misinformation and, and for that kind of ethical use. So I put them front just so that people hear me say it um, because I think that the balance of what I wanna just talk about for a few minutes is the potential, which is that what AI does is it actually will help in terms of education, it will help create, it will help us co-create, as Andrea said. It will help us design in different ways. It will help us reduce um, tasks that you normally do that a machine could do. And it should not replace the human interaction. But there's something else that's really important. In this world that we are moving into, it's a world of critical thinking. It's a world of application. And so if teachers can actually help students, because students and, and the inequity issues are really important too. Students who have access to not only AI, but to an internet world, to a connectivity world, are going to have more advancements than students who don't. But for the students that have access, they're playing games on their computers. They're doing all sorts of design already. They may be doing it faster than their teachers are doing. So if we create in schooling a way of thinking about AI, a way of using AI, a way of using it in English, in social studies, in science, in mathematics, in other ways. If we actually help create career paths for kids into technology, into other things, then we are aligning passion and purpose as opposed to passion being in one place and school being purpose in another place. And so it is, it's, it's exciting to think about the possibility because this is where the world is going. And so if we don't do it in schools, if we don't help harness it in schools, then we're gonna have huge inequity again, but we're also not teaching a way that's in, 
with, with the ethical standards that we need and in a way that is aligned to the business of today and to tomorrow and to the work of today and tomorrow and to the needs and policy needs of today and tomorrow. So it's a really important way to get this right. We didn't get it right in terms of social media. The regulation, the standards, the all of that didn't happen and see what's happened in terms of social media. So these principles really talk about generative AI is really important and it's, or it's here. Machine learning is here. And what are we going to do to harness it in a way where teachers and kids are the center? And what are we gonna do long-term in terms of the guardrails? So the last piece I'll say is where, um, you know, Andreas spent most of his time, which is how do you create an environment in classrooms where teachers have that latitude to do that and the time to do that and to be that co-creator. Now that's gonna take time and that's gonna take that time to teach teachers and it's gonna be to take time to really adopt it into schools. And so that is the piece that school districts around the world have had trouble with, which is giving teachers the authority and the discretion to do this kind of work. So these principles include all of that. And I'm really glad that we, um, that, that I hope that the world um, takes them as seriously as you see Andreas and I speaking about them. Yep, fantastic. Well, I'm gonna invite um, everybody to come on screen um, at this point. Uh, and um, Donnie, I'm just gonna ask if you might take a lead here and then I'll go to others and get them to introduce themselves. But I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so <laughs> I met you just uh, a little while ago in uh, the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. Well, you uh, called it a Commonwealth. A... Most people forget that part. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I met I met uh, you as a very recent teacher of the year uh, in that in that Commonwealth, uh, and as a, a teacher uh, in a, a very impressive elementary school but what was uh, I think particularly inspiring and motivating was precisely what Randy has just identified namely the translation of this into practice mm -hmm. uh, if, if you I'm going to ask you to do two things Donnie if you could uh, by the way if you, if you don't think my introduction was adequate you can add to it but um, <laughs> I'm also a dad there's do... that too <laughs> <laughs> well we're going to ask you to do two things one can you pick up on what Andreas described as the centrality of teachers mm -hmm. in this entire exercise and what Randy made clear was enabling conditions in the system so that the profession can seriously mm -hmm. take the lead. But can you pick up on those challenges and comment also on the nine guidelines? Because I think that what's going to be interesting is to hear how you see this in practice, how you see the work itself, but also whether those guidelines in a very significant document uh, can really help us as we go down the path that Randy's talked about. So, you know, as I was reading over the guidelines, as I was prepping to, to hop on here, um, I what, what struck me was, and especially as Randy was talking, as Andreas was talking, um, I mean, AI has been in the forefront of everybody's news discussion for the last year, you know, chat GPT, Three just launched last November, a year over a year ago. I was fortunate enough to discover it the day it came out. Immediately realized, okay, this it could be potentially bigger than Google, YouTube. And so, as a classroom teacher with 18 years experience, I immediately started to think, okay, so if this is here, um, like Randy said, I know this is not going to replace teachers because nothing can. Um, but okay, so if I'm a fourth grade teacher and I'm teaching fractions. Or if I'm a ninth grade teacher and I'm trying to have my students understand, you know, some, some physics concept, that's great. How can these tools, whether it's ChatGPT, whether it's Google Bard, or, you know, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, I, I'm going to use a metaphor from the 1970s here, but we are at the Atari 2600 of, of AI and that it's only going to get better. It's only going to improve. Um, and so I really think it's important that we as educators start to realize how can we um, or how should we start to adapt and adjust our lesson plans so that way we can be co-creators 
um, with learning. I mean, I think a lot of educators nowadays, when they just from a typical classroom teacher perspective, when, when they think of AI, um, the, we can call a spade a spade. The majority of them think, oh, it's just something that students can use to do their homework for them, or it's something that a teacher can use to create a reading passage. Um, when I wrote my book on AI last year, um, my immediate push was try to think, okay, yes, it can do that, but how can we use AI um, as co-creators to help us as teachers become more creative in the profession? Right. How can it make us better educators? Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, that's what my big push has been when I'm talking to teachers, when I'm talking to admins, when I'm talking to people trying to roll out policy, how can you bring educators into this to help not only you know, make them better professionals, but also impact student learning. Hey, it's brilliant. I, I'm going to go around the table now and get each of you to introduce yourselves, uh, just about uh, your location, your role, and then I'm going to come back to you and ask a couple of questions. But if we just do some really quick introductions first, Kevin, can you just model uh, a fast introduction? Uh, my name is Kevin Johnston. I work in the U.S. Department of Education at the Office of Educational Technology. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to go across my screen. Hyungji, can I come to our, our teacher colleague from South Korea? Hi, I am Yongju Ho, a teacher from Korea. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, to your to your left on my screen, yes, I mean, you uh, Good to see you. So we've got both a uh, teacher and I don't know whether I should say student or not. Is that appropriate? From, uh, I think, Stefan, this is one of your colleagues, correct? Yes. Hello, my name is Hyung Kyung Yoon. Um, I'm a student at Sciences Po. I'm a master's student at Sciences Po and uh, currently an intern at the OECD. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Alison, come in. Hi, I'm Alison Little John. I'm a professor and director of the UCL Knowledge Lab at University College London. The Knowledge Lab is a research centre focusing on technology and education, specialising in AI. Thank you very much. And Stefan, uh, I should just acknowledge um, uh, you're not uh, just another person here. You actually have been driving this report in the most significant of ways and have led the work. So I just want to acknowledge that leadership congratulate you on a fantastic uh, launch, but just say a word about yourself. Thank you, Tony. So I'm Stefan Vincent Lantrin and, and had the pleasure to lead indeed, you know, the, the work that led to the Digital Education Outlook 2023. Thank you. Well, Kevin and Alison, let me come to you both first, um, because it strikes me that we're having a conversation here, and I'll come back to Randy and to Andres, obviously, but it just strikes me we're having a conversation where the research and development work that's required, the system conditions that need to be enabling to be able to advance this agenda, right? And then the capacity of uh, our teachers, of learners, of parents, and we're talking about an ecosystem here, so there's lots of other players, to get all of that in the language that we're using here, right? This is about effective and equitable ecosystems. Um, so, Kevin, are you feeling optimistic? Are we heading in the right direction here? <laughs> um, I think we are very focused on making sure that we're helping support partnerships because partnerships are the only thing that bring optimism in this space. Making sure that we're helping so that the right people are at the right at the table as things move from idea to prototype to product to rollout so that you have the right community buy-in you know, from the very beginning, uh, because there are lots of ways in which you could see this not going so well. Um, but if you have the right people there, uh, then we're, we're hopeful that we can you know, design things that meet people's needs, because it is a powerful tool uh, to meet needs. And Kevin, the essence of your work and how you've contributed to this report, just say a word about that. Yeah, so our office uh, released a, a report in May of uh, that was about artificial intelligence, the future of teaching and learning. And we had kind of our seven core recommendations. And I think those were, uh, you know, part of what we brought to this larger piece of thinking about, you know, humans in the loop and thinking about um, making sure that we're having, focusing R&D on addressing context 
And we've been working uh, with OECD to kind of help uh, think through, you know, what that looks like in this uh, more cooperative version, not just from the U.S. Department of Education. Got it. So, Alison, again, can you just say a word about the focus of your own work, but perhaps how you're seeing it playing out, uh, not only obviously in your own geography, <laughs> but more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, to start with the second point that you mentioned, um, ecosystems are really complex. So this is a really interdisciplinary problem. And we are going to have to organize ourselves in a very interdisciplinary way to try to make sure that we don't upset the ecosystems. Because again, using the analogy of biological ecosystems, they, they tend to be very fragile. Um, the work that we've been doing, we've, we have colleagues here, a number of colleagues have been working with organizations around the world. Uh, I'll give a special mention to my colleague Wayne Holmes, who's working on uh, guidelines for the Council for Europe, which have been adopted. Um, yep. most, most of our work, basically, if I can summarize it, emphasizes the need to be critical, um, the need to balance humans with the technology. I really liked what uh, Christina Callas said about Estonia focusing on learner development and teacher development, as well as app development and dashboard development. Um, and I think guideline three, uh, which focuses on, on teachers, um, you know, we, we have to also think about everyone in the ecosystem. That includes learners, parents, everyone. So this balance of the human development and understanding of AI, as well as the AI development and understanding of humans has to be really balanced. I think that's the main message from us here at the Knowledge Lab. Yeah, that's just just one extra addition to that, Alison, because I think as you pick up on guideline three, there's no question about, um, as you say, both teacher agency and professional learning being at the heart of this. But um, the digital literacy that we are talking about and the digital competence competencies that we're talking about, you're saying need to be very much alive and well in the entire ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you ask people who are actually developing, for example, AI, large language models, how it all works, many of them don't really know because because of the complexity of these systems. So yeah. how can a how can a learner understand how these systems work and what the effects would be going through the system? So I think certainly looking at digital literacy and understanding of of these systems and and their effects is important for everyone going forward. Stefan, uh, you you've been at the heart of this, and I'm going to ask you to make a comment, and then I'm going to ask if you might um, include. Uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, our two Korean colleagues. I know uh, one based in South Korea, the other at OECD. So you might just bring them into the conversation. But it just strikes me that the the three themes that are played out in this year's uh, outlook at system level, classroom level, and the level of human centeredness really helps us to think about a way forward. Uh, given that you've had oversight of this, can you make a couple of comments about that and then um, perhaps bring in uh, our two colleagues? Yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, so for, first, you know, you, you're absolutely right that we need to think about the systems with uh, human beings, you know, and, and so in too many cases we focus on the technology when in fact we're talking about uh, hybrid systems, which moves the two aspects. And I think that's really one of the very important uh, message of it. I think I would like to echo what one of the things that Mr. Costa said in the previous session and, and about the why and the purpose of doing all these things. And I think that at this stage, it struck me that um, we are still in that process. And Mr. Kellas was saying it, you know, how we can actually explore what we can do with all these different things, you know, how can we actually personalize in a meaningful way? And in many countries, the reason perhaps why there is no digital transformation it's partly technical and organizational, but uh, it's also to some extent, uh, uh, you know, that the vision is not there yet, you know, and I think that that's really where some of the international collaboration could happen. The fact that, you know, we can uh, see, for example, you know, how uh, in the US, you know, they have uh, uh, used 
early warning systems and if you know what kind of data you need to make this happen and how effective they are uh and you know how ai can actually support you know uh, 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 human interventions and that's something which is usually difficult to do you know but it's some sometimes it's really kind of a lack of vision for that um and i think that you know the, the of course you know there is one aspect of the, the 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 book you know and the project is that we have two dimensions one which is really using the data that are collected through this ecosystem in a meaningful way so that it can actually inform and become actionable and inform decisions in schools decisions of teachers etc and then we have the aspect which is really the focus on teaching and learning and how to use these things you know in 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 the classroom and i really believe that that's where young Zhu and 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 young Kyung, you know can really contribute and how what they've experienced, what Young Kang, for example, had experienced as a student, you know, in terms of the good uses of digitalization and a lot of interesting things that Young is also doing in his classroom uh, in Korea. Well, then we'd, we'd love to hear a little bit about this. So please come in. Yeah, um, I use two types of AI tools in my class. First, I use AI courseware like Duolingo to offer adaptive learning and personalized learning to my students. With these AI courseware, students' learning data can be accumulated online in real time. And I, teacher, can monitor my students' learning data in real time by using dashboards. In this way, I have made my class paperless, started accumulating students' learning data online and minimize, uh, minimize student learning defeats. The second way, uh, the, uh, the second uh, most common AI tool I use in my class is general, generative AI tools like ChatGPT and MidJourney. By using these tools, I have been able to improve, you know, classroom productivity beyond just accumulating students' learning data. By using AI tools like these, my students can grow from consumers of education to producers of education, or they can go beyond just being producers of education and become reviewers of education because they have to choose, select, and review what AI tools produce. But when, when it comes to bringing AI tools in my class, I always check two things in advance from, uh, from AI tools terms of use. First, is my students' learning data protected? Second, are my students the right and safe age to use these tools? Uh, by doing so, I use AI tools in my classroom in a productive way as well as in an uh, ethical way. Thank you very much. And uh, Hugh and Yong, uh, what about you bring the perspective that you have? Because I, I had I had six questions for you, but I won't ask all six. <laughs> I'll just ask you to say something about your own experience here, and particularly, I think, um, personal experience in uh, using AI, being familiar with the technology, appreciating the question to what extent you now see this uh, within schools, and what was your own experience? Well, I think as a student, I lived a very interesting time because I came from when um, I was in elementary school, for example, uh, we weren't able to use Google, like first grade, second grade, uh, Google was not a thing. But then in the late 2000s, it became um, the biggest search engine. So we, I went from um, doing homework from books to using Google. But I think the very interesting part is that whenever we transition from um, a, a one technology period to another, there's always a regulation that followed. Guidances, for example, we weren't allowed to use Google when we're doing homework, but because the, the curriculum itself was about like um, more of a passive uh, education, but then it, I, I could feel that the curriculum was slowly changing as Google and the search engine became um, a bigger thing and a lot of people started to use it. It, it, it became to um, utilizing information that we have in the internet. And then now with the generative AI, because generative AI produces the information that we want, um, kind of mimicking the creative thinking that uh, now curriculums enforce, um, it's really hard for teachers and educators to really check if students are actually learning or are they producing knowledge or are they inter interacting with the knowledge and that's where the hardship comes um, in terms of uh, 
uh, generative AI and AI in general. However, I feel like um, as we discussed before, it's it's um, uh, we are figuring out a way how to find that strike that balance between guidance and fostering um, the use of technology. Uh, and personally, I think that generative AI and use of AI and personalized education is um, a very positive direction in education because as we were reaching digitalization, um, the will to learn and the motivation to learn has become more important because there's a lot of information in the internet and uh, there's a lot of things that we can utilize in, in uh, the digital space, but without the motivation to look for it or the motivation to actually use them, it's yeah. uh, it became harder for students to follow up and for educators to um, enforce that to students. Um, so with the personalized learning, it, it will be easier for educators as well to track um, inside the classrooms with the analytics and um, the, the, uh, the compiled data to really track that's, students. Yeah. That's really helpful. But Donnie, let me bring you back in for a moment, and then I'm going to go to Randy and Andreas for a comment. But um, it just strikes me that the language we've been using here about uh, teacher agency and learner agency and and co-construction, right? That is what your world is. Mm -hmm. That is your classroom. Yeah. It, 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 just, just give us a sense of what that looks like. What does it feel like on a daily basis? And have you got a couple of examples where you can say, hey, listen, this is what I'm doing right now? In, in terms of stuff that I'm doing with AI with my students? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So... I mean, first off, I'm an elementary school teacher. Um, so, you know, most AI tools are not, you know, you have to be 13 or above or 18 or above to use them. So I think that that's something very important to think about that the nine-year-olds in my classroom, while when they go home, they might do it there. They might have a parent who signs them up. I do not say, all right, kids, we're going to break all the rules. We're just going to use this today. I don't do that. However, I do think it's important that just like with other safety tools, like uh, Randy earlier was talking about um, social media. As teachers, we still need to be teaching students how this stuff works. Um, not necessarily at a young age. I don't think on, on the first day of kindergarten, we should give a kid a Chromebook and say, hey, this is going to do all your work for you. It's just a robot. I think that we still, as educators, especially as an elementary school teacher, need to make sure that we are um, really setting the bedrock for instruction, reading, math, writing, all that in there. Um, however, I I can't deny the fact that that AI has played a significant impact in what my instruction and just the types of activities that I'm doing with my students um, have been over the past year. Um, you know, in addition to uh, AI being able to generate text and paragraphs, learned very very quickly that it's also really really good at writing code. Um, particularly Python, JavaScript, things that I know a little bit about. I can you know do I can make JavaScript or Python say, hello world. That's about the extent of my knowledge. Um, but a friend said, hey, did you ever think about asking an AI tool to write some code for you? I said, no. So decided to have it write just a simple multiplication practice thing for my students. Um, wrote some script in about two seconds, copied it into a code editor, pressed go, um, and it didn't work. There was an error the first time. So me as an educator, I'm like, okay, well, there's the error code, copy the error code, put that into the AI. And the AI said, whoops, my mistake. Let me go ahead and correct this code. And then it was something that my students can do in the classroom. Do I have time for one more example, Anthony? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in my classroom, we have a lot of classroom jobs, um, you know, everything from, you know, simple stuff like door holder to, uh, <laughs> sorry, just trying to think of some of the other ones, uh, you know, like tech guru and all that. But one of them, I have a bird feeder in, in my window. And, uh, you know, for years, I've always just had students, same time a bird comes there, we just have a little checklist. We kind of check off, oh, there's a blue jay, there's a wren, there's a whatever. Um, and one of my students this year uh, said, hey, it'd be great if we could figure out a way where we could take a picture of every single bird that came to our bird feeder in our classroom. And I, I said, well, you know, you don't have a phone. I'm not going to let that they had that out. So decided to go to AI and AI suggested that I buy a Raspberry Pi, a cheap one, about $40. I showed me the camera to buy, even showed me the script to run and how to rig it up to a button. 
So basically any, you know, one that classroom job now is when a bird comes to our bird feeder, the student goes and hits the button, counts down from three, it takes a picture. And it even taught me how to upload that, that photo to the cloud. And I know I'm on a panel about AI. So like, oh, this kid's just like a super dork. He must really, really knows. I really, I cannot emphasize enough that I know nothing when it comes to coding. And it literally walked me through every step. Um, and that's something I'm trying not to take for granted because if I can figure this out, I know that this is something that students as they get older are going to learn more and more some of the things that they'll be able to create with AI. Hey, Kevin, you're, you're smiling a bit there. Um, is this resonating? I just think it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to think about what we need to be preparing our students for. And this is something we're putting a lot of thought into here at the Department of Education is like, what is the future of work and how yep. is AI yep. impacting that? Yep. And uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, I just think it's really fascinating to think about uh, the ways in which, you know, Donnie's helping his students begin to see the way that these are changing around them um, so that they're not caught by surprise when you know suddenly the school veil is lifted in 12th grade or something like that. That's lovely. I'm, I'm going to come to Randy and Andreas in a moment and ask a couple of questions that have been coming through the chat that will uh, take us out a little bit uh, larger to uh, question about policy and how we might be able to cooperate. But is there any other reaction that people wanted to play into the conversation here at the moment, very much at the level of practice? Come in if you'd like to. Okay, if not, <laughs> I'm going to uh, move on to ask Randy and Andreas. And Alison, you might want to come in on this as well. There's a couple of questions here which resonate with the last session as well, namely that surely we must be in the game now of international cooperation. Well, we've got that <laughs> with this very paper, this very document, right, Randy? I mean, that's exactly what it is. But some of the questions are saying, in generating the nine guidelines, did we talk to Cambridge? Did we talk to the IB? Did we talk to Pearson? Are we thinking seriously about how curriculum developers who are developing curriculum at an international level and then it's being applied at a national and a local level, are they engaged in this conversation? How do you want to play them in, Randy? Well, I'm laughing about it because normally they're the ones who try to dictate to us what to do and this time <laughs> it was the opposite which is this time you we talked to let's put it this way we talked to professors we talked to teachers talked to people on the ground we talked to people in governments who are like heaven who are trying to figure out how to do this this time we're saying you know it should be the people who actually teach children that start leading this work as opposed to curriculum as opposed to for-profit curriculum writers telling us what right. to do again. And and that's and so, but I would also say, and this may be somewhat controversial, but you heard it from the teachers here. <clears throat> we need to fundamentally transform teaching and learning in schools to adopt to the world of today and tomorrow. If the accountability systems in our worlds are still testing for memorization and we need to be talking about application and really helping um, because ChatGPT and others are dealing with all the memorization. It's kind of like the, what the calculator did to math. Then we really have to change the accountability systems, because you can't have an accountability system that is back to the 1990s or the 1980s or the 1950s, but you have a system of learning that is in 2023 and with doing project-based and application-based, which is what all these amazing teachers talked about, the integration with different disciplines, the so so this so so this actually creates a real dilemma. And I'm glad, Kevin, you're on, creates a dilemma for the United States. It creates a dilemma for others to be able to do that. You have to give educators the who, who are willing to take the risk and have the ingenuity 
to start using tools so that other educators can see, feel, and touch it, you have to give them the agency to do this. And that I believe means our classrooms need to look much more project-based, much more experientially based, much yeah. more hands-on based. And that's, and that's gonna freak the um, curriculum writers out even more than anything else. Hey, just, just before I come to Andreas, <laughs> Alison, you mentioned that you are, thank you, Randy, you mentioned that you are collaborating a lot, right, across boundaries and borders. Um, just give us a bit of a sense of how you're seeing the relative strength of those partnerships in supporting this, this agenda. Well, partnerships are absolutely foundational to moving in a positive direction, right? So uh, it shouldn't be researchers telling practitioners what to do um, but practitioners need to also uh, take into consideration some of the, the the research findings that's very complex and then uh, we need to extend that across the different disciplines involved here so this is not just about informatics uh, computer science and development of, of AI and, and coding it's also about education it's about social policy it is very complex. So in an ideal world, we have ways to enable people to be able to talk together. Now, people have got different motivations and different languages for describing things. So we need to create environments uh, that enable people to be able to understand yeah. one another and, and uh, understand the motivations as well. So uh, in the Knowledge Lab here, as well as with our colleagues around the world. Um, I think some of the methodologies that we use around participatory design or co-design, that has to go beyond just simply being methods to be able to create outcomes that will make, it will create benefits for all the people in the ecosystem, the learners, the parents, yeah. the teachers, everybody. Andres, um, let me just ask you whether you've got a comment on the, I suppose, in a sense, it's the role of OECD itself, because um, there's a, as you said in your uh, earlier presentation, the the kind of distribution of uh, advancement of this agenda across multiple countries, right? <laughs> it's very different in very di in different places. I mean, are you getting a sense that this is going to accelerate? that an OECD and others can actually help broker, that they can work with ecosystems, that we can devise governance arrangements, that we can get checks and balances that these guidelines tell us are necessary. Are you, are you feeling uh, optimistic that, in fact, we really can cooperate together here? Um, and not just OECD, but certainly OECD can make a significant contribution, not just in doing reports, but actually helping to advance the agenda. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Uh, first of all, on the on the question that you asked earlier, we did actually talk to tech companies and researchers because it's important when you develop guidelines that you understand the frontiers of, of technology development. Yeah. I think the point that Randy was making, I think it's an important one. These guidelines are designed around the needs of learners and they're not designed around the providers. But obviously, you know, we talked with them. We had, I mean, my colleague Stefano was really the, the engine of that, spent a lot of his time actually to ensure that we understood, you know, what is technologically possible? What are desirable kind of ways of using, you know, AI and data? And then, you know, think together with, with, the, with the teaching profession, how can we bring that to bear and what are the kind of opportunities, guidelines and guardrails? Uh, don't read those guidelines too literally and too religiously. Okay. You know, they are just, you know, capturing the current state of a rapidly evolving field. I think that's also really important. The reason why we developed, and this comes to your second question, why global dialogue is so important. They're really a framework to actually create and enhance and support this global discussion on how we actually shape that environment for technology use in education. These guidelines will evolve. They will, you know, as technology evolves, as our use of it evolves. And um, so they are basically designed to provide a framework to bring the teaching profession together with government to actually shape that space in a very active phase. They actually came out 
in the first international summit of the teaching profession where ministers and union leaders met. So that was actually, you know, the starting point for all of this. And this is really the spirit of this, you know, providing uh, a framework. Uh, as you say, you know, the world is in very different places on this. If you go to, you know, East Asia, uh, there is a very kind of uh, open uh, mind towards the active use of AI. You know, I was in Korea, looking at the digital textbooks, the you know AI-based personal tutors that students have. I mean, this is just incredible what is happening there. Uh, you have other parts of the world where there's a lot of innovation, but in a very patchy way. You can look at the United States. You know, a lot of interesting things happen, but probably not the kind of ecosystems approach that we're talking about. You have Europe somewhere in the middle and the, the global dialogue that the OECD creates is really to see, you know, where are we in different places? Where, what do, where, where do we want to be in different places? And what can we learn from and with each other to actively shape this environment? In the earlier session, I think Minister Kallas made a really important point that, you know, while national curricula, while, while curricula, are domestic, while education is a very kind of domestic field of public policy, technology is not. Technology is global. T technology is interconnected. And uh, it is evolving at, at breathtaking speed. So this really highlights the need for us to think about this in a more global perspective and uh, to learn from and with each other and also to think about precisely you know, what kind of framework and guidelines do we want to establish. And this is really the purpose of this document. Stefan. Yes, I wanted to 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 make a, a comment that uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, AI in education is not just generative AI, which is a generative which is a general purpose technology, and so there are a lot of tools that are actually uh, especially designed for education, and you know we need to 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 think about them. We we're trying to work and to to build on what Addison said, you know, we and we'll have a session on that tomorrow as well, you know. So co-creation is one of the very important aspects of the guidelines and also of the of the book. And trying to find ways to actually get the design of this tool started with actually teachers and make sure that what you know is actually being produced uh really makes sense, you know, to improve things in the in the classroom. So we always say it, but in fact, it's very difficult to have the right institutions to to do that and to go just beyond, you know, uh, uh, consulting teachers once the product is already designed. And so there are new ways of thinking around that, which which are very important. And perhaps last comment is on the international collaboration. And the, the, what struck me, you know, when we interviewed all the different uh, uh, people in different countries. Uh, was this idea of past dependency, you know? And so basically that's, we have this evolution of responsibilities in our country, that's how we've done things. And so that's how it is also done in the case of technology. But perhaps actually we should think differently, you know, perhaps in some cases we shouldn't do the same thing as what we did before with textbooks, because, you know, the case is slightly different. And especially for equity, you know, the challenges can be very different and, and may need to have a, uh, you know, a different kind of thinking. And what the international space brings us is really a laboratory of a lot of different practices, ways of dealing with things, which really can open our way of thinking about how to, to address some of these uh, 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 issues, basically. Okay, I've got time for a, a closing comment <laughs> from each of you of about 30 seconds. So it's not a lot. And I'm going to finish with Randy and then ask Andreas if he might uh, close the session for me. So... Uh, in that spirit, the chat is going everywhere from uh, questions around risks, Randy, some of the ones that you raised in your opening comments, and they are of an order that go from questions of privacy through to serious concerns about misinformation and disinformation. Then there's others who are arguing the question about whether or not the teaching profession is going to be able to have the resources and the time to seriously become, uh, I guess what we would say is digitally literate, although I think, Johnny, when you talked about <laughs> your own experience, right, it didn't require you to go through a 10 session course. <laughs> so be very interesting to hear what you say. And then we've obviously got uh, other questions at the moment around uh, how we might tackle uh, this agenda in uh, circumstances that play into Randy's point about equity. So uh, whatever you think might be the appropriate closing comment, uh, you and Yong, I'm going to start with you. What's your closing comment? Um, 
Well, as a student, I feel like students are ready to adapt to uh, the, the, the use in AI, use of AI into education. Uh, as digital natives, we do know how to use AI and we, we do use AI in our works and our homeworks and our assignments. So um, if there's a way forward and if, if there's a positive change, I, I think it is time for all of us to think about something creative. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Yanju, come in, please. Um, we as teachers must teach our students about the hallucination of AI because simply utilizing AI tools without critical thinking is like having a document reviewed by someone who is not competent to review it. So we must also tell our students that wrong views of AI is a crime from effects to you know portray infringements and to copyright infringement so high tech with responsibilities thank you thank you very much fantastic Alison well my summation would be to focus on the human rather than technology so focus on human development think about human knowledge um AI knowledge is helpful but it's it's simply something for us to use and think about human agency rather than the agency of the machines thank you Alison. kevin yeah as we've met with educators and leaders across the country we the thing that's resonated most from us has been uh humans in the loop and we mean that in the most serious sense of partnering with ai and not letting it run its automated uh, vision, but really making sure that at every critical decision point, uh, there's a informed, connected educator guiding the process. Thank you very much. Donnie, 30 seconds. Well, I mean, just like with every other tech tool, just because it exists doesn't mean you need to use it all the time. I mean, there's still something to doing a read aloud with your students. There's still something to sitting down with a dry erase board and walking a student how to do a two-step multiplication problem. Um, so again, these tools exist, they're only going to get better, but to me, that just emphasizes the need for teachers, how we not only how to figure out how to use these tools, but how we can use them to help better us as professionals. Thank you. Randy. Harnessing the possibilities and minimizing the perils is what all of society is going to have to do with these tech tools. And the more teachers have the agency to do that on a very local and classroom level, the more comfortable people will be with the potential and the more we will um, be able to deal with the peril. Learning and Thank not you. being scared of the algorithm is really going to be important long-term. Got it. Stefan, I'm gonna thank you for bringing us together. <clears throat> I'm going to pass to Andreas for a final word. Thanks, Tony. You know, I think everything has been said. The future is not with, you know, about humans versus artificial intelligence, but about humans with AI. And I think, you know, guideline, we need guidelines, guardrails, and op but also see clearly the opportunities that help us, you know, make this a reality. You know, those opportunities are really about a transformation, about making learning more interesting, more engaging, more fun, more personal and more equitable. We should not forget that AI holds the promise actually to just engage with the diversity of learner needs in much more creative ways than we can possibly do uh, without it. Uh, but to achieve that, you know, we really, and I think, you know, Kevin just said it, you know, we need to put humans in, in the loop. And I would go one step further, not just in the loop. We want to see educators it's very central to the design of those tools no? and actually be the engineers of those tools and then you know facilitate it through technology i think that's really really important so that we uh, it enable a, a truly human-centered approach that facilitates learning in the 21st century but what i also we also designed these guidelines in my this idea in mind that you know uh we can't you know uh get too far off the track. Like there's a risk that, you know, we are we are seeing too many of the problems, too many of the risks, and then cloud the opportunities that are here for a genuine transformation. I think that's really what this is about. Well, thank you, one and all. The chat has indicated uh, just how much people have appreciated uh, this panel, which is a remarkable collection of, of colleagues. So thank you 
for a great session. And I know that many who have joined us are about to go to their third session in a row. So again, our appreciation. Thank you.